Suddenly all the shame is gone I thought I was too broken Now I see You were breaking new ground inside of me Standing in your presence, Lord I can feel you digging all my roots up I feel you healing all my wounds up All I can say is hallelujah
church. Great to see you guys here today. Hey, uh, I can't help but uh, be excited about this morning. This first song uh, is, is one that was done in the early 2000s by a guy by the name of David Crowder. And uh, back when I was first learning how to play guitar, this was one of the ones that we used to do. And uh, so if you would, stand and join us while we, we worship him.
feels like I should just not preach. What do you think? Okay. okay. <laughs> Pizza with the pastor. Here we go. Yeah. Now, uh, just I hope as we sing, because sometimes we, when we sing in worship, you know, it's it's uh, it echoes our, the cry of our heart. It's the truth of what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And other times, well, the words don't match up with how we think or feel. And sometimes it's what we want to feel or want to think. Um, and so it's aspirational. But no matter what, I hope and pray that uh, the worship that here today has has helped you take a step towards God. At 3C, man, it's so great to see you today. Did you guys have a happy Easter? Hope so. Yes. Uh, I know we did. We had three baptisms last week. Yeah. Amen. Yep. And we've got two more today. Yeah. So uh, it's going to be later on after our pizza with the pastor and uh, they're bringing family to that. So it's going to be a good time. Hey, speaking of pizza with the pastor, if for some reason you haven't signed up and you want to come and you're new to 3C and you haven't really connected in any real way or to one of us on staff or people here, uh, that's what it's for. It's really just a lunch to hang out together, but especially for those who are new and are, are still not feeling totally connected that's what that for we got like 24 people coming to pizza with the pastor so it's going to be a great time if you haven't signed up for that and want to come it's going to be following second service so around 12 15 but feel free to come back for that if you want to there's all kinds of stuff going on in this card which is in front of you in seats sprinkled throughout uh, the worship center if you uh, see something on here that you're interested in doing please check that off fill out the other side with your information and throw it in one of these boxes around here. If you are a guest here or new around here, uh, we would love to know that you're here as well. Just fill this out and drop it in there. We'll send you a little gift card as a way of saying thank you for joining us today because we know trying something new can be awkward or weird. And so we're just grateful that you've joined us here today. And we want to we'll thank you for joining us. A couple things in particular mentioned pizza with the pastor. At the end of the month, on April 28th, is our next step class. And so uh, we've talked a lot about baptism around here. That's a perfect place. If you've been exploring that, I want to continue that conversation to have that. If you've not ever formally joined our, our, our family here at 3C and have questions about that, it's really to help anyone who's taking, feels like God's leading them to take a next step on their spiritual journey. So we can answer practical questions to some of the spiritual questions. And uh, so next step is really for anyone who feel like God is nudging them to something next in their life. And so we hope that you'll take advantage of that and all the things that are going on around here. Uh, if you haven't quite yet uh, grabbed the communion elements or the Lord's Supper elements, they're on the sides and in the back. Uh, Brother Dave is going to lead us in that. You can also throw your gifts of tithe and offerings in the uh, wooden boxes with the crosses on it uh, in there as well. But if you haven't gotten your communion elements, feel free to get up and get those right now. I'm going to grab mine as I go back to the seat. And uh, at, in the meantime, Dave will lead us in this time. Um, back in the 80s, there was this, uh, this, this, this songwriter uh, by the name of Rich Mullins. And if you're an 80s kid, you might remember that there wasn't too much in the world of Christian music out there. You had some Amy Grant, and you had some Petra, and you had some other kind of wild guys. But uh, in the midst of all of that was this guy by the name of Rich Mullins. And if you haven't seen the movie, I would, I would recommend it. Uh, it's called Ragamuffin, and it's the story of Rich Mullins. And um, Rich Mullins was an imperfect person. He struggled his entire life with sins and issues and things that were going on in his life, and he struggled that. And a lot of his music that really comes out in this raw form that's just just it's an amazing, it's an amazing piece. And if you don't know the story, in in the '90s, uh, Rich Mullins died in a tragic car accident, and it was this terrible thing. But his legacy kind of lived on. He had worked on an Indian reservation, uh, uh, teaching Indians how these these Native Americans how to sing and how to play music so that they could make money on that reservation. They could do things with that. And he had done so many great things in this world, and it seemed like such a tragedy for him, for him to die at a young age. But his legacy lived on. My wife used to talk about him and how she used to see him at CIYs and the great things he could do. And here would come this guy in just a pair of blue jeans and a white T-shirt. That's all he ever wore. He lived a very simple life. 
Jesus, the hero of Rich Mullins, lived a similar lifestyle. He was a renegade. When Jesus was here, he went against the things that were out there. He went against the flow. He went against the standard traditions of the day. And unlike Rich Mullins, Jesus was perfect. And in the end, Jesus died. And one of the songs that Rich Mullins wrote, we're going to sing here next, it's called Creed. And as we talk today about mission and our mission as Christians here in this community of Bethel, Understanding that the, the heart of all of that is in what you believe about Jesus. What you believe about Jesus, how Jesus came as a perfect person and lived a lifestyle to change. The change being that he was going to die so that we could have a chance at life. And so today as we do every Sunday. We remember the life of Jesus. We remember what he did. And as he instituted for us with some bread, he set up a, a remembrance of him. And he said, take and eat, for this is my body. And then he took some juice and he said, drink this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you so much for the day. We thank you for your love, for your blood that was spilled and your body that was broken. And Lord, as we prepare to open our hearts to the things that you would have us here today, <clears throat> we just thank you for what you've done, we believe in you, and we believe in what you have established in us. Love you, Jesus. Amen. Father, 
Almighty Maker of heaven and Maker of earth, and in Jesus Christ His only begotten Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit, one holy church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in a life that never ends, and I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. Well, I did not make it, no, it is making me. I said I did not make it, no, it is making me. I did not make it, no, it is making me. It is the very truth of God and not the invention. some time to find myself, all right? Maybe, you, maybe you've maybe you never said that, but have you heard someone say that? You know, I, I just need some time to find myself. I just need to, to go and find myself, or I'm going to spend this season or, or this season traveling or exploring to try to find myself. You know, uh, some of us have said that. Others of us might, you know, look down our noses at someone and say, that. what does that mean? Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that we all suffer an identity crisis at some point or another. And, and really, that's the idea that at, from the very beginning, when God created things the way they ought to be, uh, there were relationships broken, and one of the relationships that were broken and shattered and confused and disoriented is the relationship with ourself. We, we were in a good space with God. We did walk with God, and it, it was good, right? And then all of a sudden, sin enters the world by our choice, and things get broken. That we were naked and unashamed before sin entered the world, and now we're, we're naked and ashamed. We're, we're hiding from God. We're covering ourselves according to God's story. And in that, there is a brokenness of who we are. We, we did have a clear definition of who we were and what we were supposed to do. But then that vision or that clarity was shattered and broken when sin entered the world because now I'm confused about who's in charge. I'm confused about who's calling the shots. And maybe your your identity struggle wasn't as spiritual. Maybe it was something that happened to you. For me, when I was young, I saw myself as a basketball player or at least a basketball lover, right? And, and then when I got cut from a team in high school, and I won't get into why, but I, I struggled in the in the moment to go, well, if I'm not a basketball player, who am I? It sounds kind of lame, but if you ever lost your job, if you if you ever gone through a divorce, if you've ever gone through something tragic, there are things in life that kind of rock us and shake us to the core, and we start questioning, well, who am I and what am I supposed to do? In, in the teenage years, this is the biggest search is for your identity and purpose, and many of us pick a lane. Some of us are jocks. Some of us are, are like the hoods. Some of us are the preps. Some of us are the band geeks. You know, we, I mean, who's, who, where's my band geeks out there? They're usually loud and proud. There we go. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you pick a lane, right? And, and then you kind of identify. You may have been a hippie back in the day. 
You, you wore the right clothes, you drove the right car, but whatever lane you picked, you, you kind of formed an identity around it. it. It's no wonder. I mean, even our, my childhood heroes like Batman and Superman and the superheroes we all grew up with, Spider-Man, what do they all deal with? This identity issue. Uh, who am I? Am I Batman or am I Bruce Wayne? Am I Superman or am I Clark Kent? And it may seem weird and simple, but it is a perpetuation of many of us internal struggle. I mean, philosophers, as far back as we have documents for thousands and thousands of years, have been wrestling with four major issues of our origin, our meaning, our morality, and destiny. Where did we come from? What are we supposed to do? What am I, what's my purpose here? What is, where am I going? What's the point of all this? And philosophers have been exploring and asking those questions for years. And knowing who you are and knowing what you're supposed to do is an important clarity in life because without those, without that knowledge, life can be frustrating. It can seem like it has no direction or, or aim. And so when we Today, we're kicking off this brand new series, uh, just exploring and revisiting three C's, mission, and, and values. Today, we're going to focus on our mission statement. Uh, and a mission statement is there to, to try to clarify, and if you even look at an organization, but it's clarifying what the organization is supposed to do, or in our sake, in our position, it's what God has called us to do. A mission statement for a church is intended to clarify what God has called us to do. However, a healthy mission statement inside of that will also speak to not only what God has called us to do, but who God has called us to be. In other words, a mission statement will touch on not only our purpose, but our identity. And so when we say what we're supposed to do, this idea of what a mission statement is supposed to accomplish to clarify what we're supposed to do, it implies that there are things that we're not supposed to do, that, that, that there is a, a calling to a certain action. Because the truth is we can't do everything, and we shouldn't do everything. I mean, think of yourselves as an individual. How much trouble have you gotten yourself into by saying yes to so many things until you just get completely burnt out on the hectic schedule that you've lived your life according to. You know, the, a schedule that is packed full of to-dos and, and uh, events and extracurricular activities and work and family and all these things that are supposed to be a part of life and you suffer because you're doing too much because you've not said no to things. you said yes to too many things. A mission statement is supposed to clarify for us on what we're supposed to do and so that we can remain focused on that, so that we can remain focused and not be distracted by so many things that can get us off track on what we're supposed to do. And sometimes those things that we say yes to are good things, but sometimes we say yes to too many good things, and it gets us off track on the things we're supposed to do. To do So no and saying no, sometimes even to good things, helps us stay on focus. The Bible uses this example and illustrates this when it comes to even individuals that make up the church. It talks about the, the church being the body of Christ. It compares us as individuals as collective parts to a body. Now, now some of us are noses, some of us are our ears and eyes and, you know, listen, I, I can get to more, you know, specific body parts, but I'll stop here, right? Because uh, some of us are not as appealing of body parts, right? Armpits are out there and, yeah, that's where I'll stop, right? But the idea is if you ever, if, if your nose is trying to see, it's going to have a hard time. If, if your ears are trying to smell, that's not going to go very well. And so even in the church, there is giftings and arrangements. There are things that you are called to do and things you are not called to do and that you play a role. 
And most of the people I talk to here, and I, I, it's interesting to me, that would die if they had to get up here and talk to you. Who, who wants to volunteer? You come on out of here, right? Kim Torok said she would be the first to come. No. You know, the, the statistics show that, that uh, Americans, their number one fear is public speaking. You know what number two is? Death. Number two is death. That means they would rather die than get up here and speak, right? They would rather be in the casket at the funeral service than the one giving the eulogy up front. It doesn't make sense. But the point is not everybody's meant to be up here. Not everybody's meant to, you know, to, to sing songs. Not everybody's meant to work with kids. Not everybody's meant to go on mission trips. But there are people who do. And so we try to put noses in position to smell around here and ears in positions to hear and eyes in positions to see and armpits in position. I don't know what armpits do, okay? But we try to put those people in the armpit positions, all right? But because we have limited time and resources, it is healthy for an individual in a church to say no to things that way they could focus on the things they are supposed to be doing. And in our case, what, what God has called us to do. So sometime in the fall of 2021, our elders began a journey to try to establish and discover a clear mission statement for our church, a statement that clarifies what we're here to do and values that we'll talk about over the next few weeks as well. But the mission statement and value statements that it clarify for 3C who God has called us to be and what he's called us to do. And that sounds like not that big a deal to discover that, but when you put the idea that who God has called us to be, it's not as simple as getting together one afternoon and writing down a few ideas. It was a lengthy process of prayer and Bible study. It was a lengthy process of this, uh, re, revisiting some history here at 3C. We actually went through some exercises that listed some of the top moments that elders and a few other key members that we asked who could contribute. What are the highlights of the history of this church? And then we talked about some lowlights and some negative stuff all of which we have in our individual lives too. An exercise very healthy for all of us to clarify how God has used both the hard times and the highlights to make us who we are, to shape who we are. And of course, we, like I said, we prayed tremendously. We studied God's word from head to toe, but it also gave us a perspective on these different things and and in January of 2022, we, we got around to kind of sharing our mission and values with the church. And our mission being, we're here to be good news, where we live, work, and play. And in one of the scriptures that molded and shaped us to arrive at our mission statement is found in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 8 through 10 is where we're going to focus today. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be there. We're going to be looking at it. We're going to look at this only. It's only a few verses. But if you have it, I encourage you to mark it and revisit it. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10 was one of those scriptures that really impacted where we landed. And it says this, For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, if you look at the first few verses of this, verses 8 and 9, it teaches us something that, that you've been, if you've been hanging around here long enough, you've heard me say this before, but it's this, that, it, that God's grace is not something 
you achieve, it's something you receive. That God's grace is something you receive, not achieve. See, this grace that is received is really where we find our true identity, a grace that is received, not achieved. Grace is a lot like our name, our last name in particular. It's not something you achieve, it's something you receive at your birth, your name. It is received, not achieved. And you can be proud of your name, uh, but that's not because of what you've done. It's because of history. It's because of those who went before you and passed on this name to you. Now, you can live up to your name or you can embarrass your name. Yeah, you can do all those things, but you don't achieve your name. It's received. Your name is given to you. You can achieve a title. You can achieve a goal. You can achieve an award. And if you achieve something, you can brag about it. You can boast about it. Grace is not something you earn. It is not something you achieve. It is something you receive. You don't earn grace through work or effort. It's like a last name. It's given to you. It's not achieved. Grace can define us. It can identify us like a name, but it is something that is not achieved. It's received. Now, I'll read the scripture again, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that uh, no one can boast, for we are God's handy. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What Paul is saying in the middle of this scripture is that the gospel should both define who we are and direct how we live. The, the gospel should define who we are, our identity, and, and direct how we live, our purpose. And so when I talk about the gospel, let me just make sure everybody's clear that the gospel is synonymous with good news, that that's literally what it means. It is good news. It is, it's talking about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus being good news to us and how that represents God's grace to us, and that can be viewed as good news, which is partly why we say to be good news, where we live, work, and play. But I want to be crystal clear that good news and gospel, whenever you hear one of those, they mean the exact same thing. And so the gospel or the good news of the story of Jesus providing us God's grace is this good news for us, for who we are. And our identity, again, it's not something we achieve through our own efforts. This is our identity, which is received. It is good news that is given to us as a gift, not earned or achieved. As a Christ follower, our identity is summed up in the good news of God's grace. And so on one hand, the, the gospel the grace of the gospel or the good news, it is our identity. And the more we embrace this identity as the forgiven people, children of God, beloved, grace-filled people of God, the more effective we'll be with the next part that this scripture teaches us. But so many Christians struggle with this first part, which is why I want to highlight and emphasize our identity in Christ. You see, so many, even Christians, so many people in our culture identify as a good person, right? That's why in every funeral you go to, the person is spoken about as if they're going to a better place. Because as a culture, we evaluate ourselves on our behavior and that we pretty much label everyone as a pretty good person. And we, we, they're going to a better place because they were a good person. And are deep down, I like that too which really means they didn't behave very well, right? But deep down, they were a good person. And deep down means don't pay attention to the outside of, of their behavior, but deep down. And so many Christians identify in their relationship with God the same way the rest of the world does, that we're pretty good people, 
that we're a good person. We're not perfect by any means. We, we won't dare say that. We're not perfect, but I'm a pretty good person. And if you drill somebody down on this, it's the idea that, that God's going to show me favor because when I get to heaven, and yeah, I might have done some stuff that he wasn't happy with, but deep down, I was a pretty good person. And we identify with that as a good person. And, and this is one of the mistakes that we make as a church because we oftentimes focus on, are you a good person? Instead of, I, instead of identifying with the grace of God that makes up for sometimes the sinful person I am. When we view ourselves as pretty good people that'll probably make it into heaven, uh, we're not embracing our true identity in Christ, our desperate need for his grace. It's not a humble, die-to-self approach to our identity that grace reminds us of. When we die to self, because we don't die to self when we think we're a pretty good person. We don't think our behavior is motivation to change when we're a pretty good person already or we're good enough already. So I want to just take a minute to help us Truly make sure we're latching on to our true identity in Christ for those of us who are already followers of Jesus. I want to help us discover our true identity. And I want you to bear with me in this because I'm going to sound pretty harsh for a minute. I'm going to sound a little judgy for a second. But I just want you to answer these questions. You can pick someone to answer them, but I'm going to tell you some of these might be some hard questions to answer, so I really just want you to answer them to yourself, but some of them will be hard questions, raw questions. Uh, for some of you, it might be easy to answer, but it would be hard to say out loud, so bear with me. I'm not being too harsh. I'm trying to make a point. The first question is, have you ever lied? Anyone want to confess? All right? I don't see any hands well, yet, right? Okay, there's a few honest people that are liars. <laughs> see my point? What do you call people who have lied or lie? Liars. Well, we have a few honest people up, uh, up in here, right? Now, how many of you, again, you don't have to answer out loud, but how many of you have cheated? Cheated on anything or anyone? Cheated. All right? How many, how many of you have lost your temper? Never. I mean, we got somebody with two hands. <laughs> that needs to be me too, Candace. <laughs> two hands, right? How many of you ever said a cuss word? All right. You don't, you, that's, I'm, great, I'm grateful for you raising your hand, but you don't have to. Let me ask you this. How many of you have used God's name as a cuss word? How many of you have used your mom and dad's name as a cuss word? You know what I mean? Like, we don't do that. Well, why don't you do that? Well, I love and respect my mother and father. I would never do that. Yeah, but you'll do it to your God. So, you know, how many of you have, have done that? So how many of you have ever had too much to drink? Ever gotten drunk? Not as many hands going on, I'm just saying. How many of you have ever had sex outside of God's plan? Before marriage, during marriage with somebody who wasn't your spouse, or after marriage, whether it was death or divorce, and it went on to do it, or just looked at someone lustfully? How many of you have done that? Sh shall I go on? I mean, it's getting pretty heavy in here, right? Because I bet almost every person in this room has done most of, if not all, of those sins. And so far, if that's true of you, we've established this about you. That you're a liar, a cheat, a thief, a blasphemer, a fornicator, and a drunk. Still feel like a pretty good person? Again, I told you, I'm going to be harsh but to make a point right? If we think we're a pretty good person, we've just not realized the weight of the sin that's been involved in our life. 
I love you all. I'm not trying to guilt you into anything. I want to help you discover your true identity as the grace-filled, forgiven, beloved children of God that required Jesus' death to forgive all that. It's a little more weighty when we think of it that way. We're, we're not, we don't look so good when we think of it that way. But folks, this is the good news. That in Christ, when you have faith in him, all those sins are washed away. All those sins are forgiven and covered by the grace of God. This is the good news and as a follower of Jesus, this is your identity. When you walk around knowing that you're forgiven and you're a fellow sinner with everyone out there, you never look down your nose at any of them because you know you're a lying, cheating, thief, drunk, adulterer, whatever. And you're covered in the grace of God. That is our identity. That is the good news. Other Christians struggle with coming up with their story. They say, well, I don't have such a dramatic story to tell. I don't, you know, if I'm giving my testimony. And it's only because we haven't really appreciated the weight of our own sin and the immense generosity God has given us and showed us primarily through his death and resurrection to forgive us. And we treat everyone as if they're a good person and they're going to go to heaven when they die. No, they need a Savior. You and I are piles of dirt that God has breathed life into and has restored. That, that is this all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing creator has created us and, and we've just decided to go our own ways at times. That he's created everything that ever existed and we have the audacity to tr treat life as if it's ours and it's better run by us. This is the generous God. And when he made that choice to rid the world of evil through his son's death and sacrifice, he decided to not let us live. In fact, he'd rather do that than live without us. We can, all this to say is, we do not take credit for the grace we receive from God. We give him all the credit, but we embrace the identity we have in him. As recipients of his grace, it reveals how loving he really is, that his grace magnified when, when what was broken has been made whole, what was sinful has been made perfect, what was lost is now found, what was dead is now Alive, Grace is God's favorite work in his greatest work, which is why we are his masterpiece and his handiwork, as this says, his workmanship, his work of art, a thing, a product that he has made. It is God's grace of why we are his masterpiece and his handiwork. This picture of... Uh, uh, this sculpture, I don't know if you can tell on my shelf, it's a work of art to me. Y'all know what it is? Yeah, I didn't either when my daughter handed it to me. She handed it to me in about the first grade and said, Dad, I, I made this for you. And I said, great. A sick camel? Said, no, Dad, it's a Mustang. Her school mascot was Mustangs. And in first grade, they did a little art project, and she made it, and she was so excited to give it to me. And when you look at it, you think, all right. <laughs> but your judgment on this piece of art or work doesn't matter to me. It may not go for the same thing Picasso's paintings go for, but I don't have any Picassos sitting on my shelf, mainly because they're too expensive. But, uh, you know, 
I don't have any other pieces of art sitting around my office. But the little girl in the background made that for me. To me, it's a work of art. It's a thing of beauty because it was made for me. The object of God's grace, we are his masterpiece because we are the object of his love. His love is accomplished. His forgiveness, his grace is accomplished by covering over our sin, which is his amazing handiwork. It doesn't matter to me what people, uh, you know, uh, judge my daughter's masterpiece to be. I put it on my shelf and I love it. The love and the grace and the generosity and the forgiveness from God, that is our true identity. To God, we are his finest work, his masterpiece, his handy. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not for yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so no one can boast. This is not from yourselves. This is not because you've been a pretty good person. This is not because you, your good deeds outweigh your bad. It's not something you can brag about because it's not something you've done. It's something that you've received, not achieved. It's because our sinfulness and the grace that covers it is 100% a gift from God. If we try to identify with anything else in this world, it's going to let us down. It's going to be taken from us. It's going to leave us. It's going to die on us. It'll wear out or ruin. Our true identity is found in the love and the grace and the forgiveness of God. And I'll bring us back to the point I made earlier. That the gospel or the good news should both define who we are and direct how we live. This is why our mission statement is to be good news where we live work and play. On one hand, the good news is our identity. We are the forgiven, holy, chosen children of God, recipients of his grace. So on one hand, the good news is our identity. It's, on the other hand, the good news is our purpose. The good news is our freedom in Christ, but now it is our motivation. The good news should compel us to be good news where we live, work, and play that the good news should direct how we live, that the gospel should be both defining us and directing us. That when we know the truth about God's grace and its good news and the gospel, being good news is not an obligation. It's an honor. It's not a have to. It's a get to. When we understand God's grace, we want to respond to his love with love. I'm honored to be on stage and serve as a mouthpiece. I'm honored because of God's grace and his forgiveness. And I love to use the phrase that God used crooked sticks as staffs. We've been blessed, and now we are called to be a blessing. I've received good news, and now I get to be the good news. And that's why 3C's mission is to be good news where we live work and play. Not only has God taken great pride in the work he has already done with us, he is rewarded when his good news inspires us to represent him in his good news. That grace cannot be earned, but there is an effort involved as well. Our effort for the gospel's sake is a natural response to the grace of God. And so God is glorified when he provides us his good news and God is rewarded when we become his good news. This good news is our identity, but the good news is also our purpose that we are called to be good news for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, created to do good works for which God prepared in advance for us to do. He created us for this reason, to be good news. This is what his intention is for us. And that the good news is both our identity and our purpose, our identity, that we are the recipients of God's grace. And our purpose in the sense that we are called to represent this good news to the world around us, which is why we focus on also 
not only are we to be good news, but we're to be good news where we live, work, and play. Your identity is in Christ and in the grace Jesus provided us on the cross. We're forgiven, but we are called to love. Our identity is the loved, and so it should inspire us to love others because of God's great love. Uh, if, if any of you know Frank Redd, um, you, you know what I'm about to talk about a little bit. You'll get it a little bit more for those of you who don't. Frank has served here as an elder for many years. I don't honestly know how many years, but uh, re- he served up until uh, the end of the year last year. Uh, if you know Frank, you know him as a funny, charismatic guy. He, he led our youth group until we hired Justin. He is a fun person to hang around. And if you've hung around Frank, you know that he's his own man. Uh, he's a little stubborn at times. Hard to control, not easily reined in, right? He is certainly not a yes man, kind of a man of principle. I've never met anyone that knows more about the outdoors and this sort of thing. But Frank was served as a chairman of the elders when I was hired here. And and when we went through the process of developing our mission statement here at 3C, to be good news where we live, work, and play, um, he was he was on the elders team that, that contributed to this whole exploration exercise, but he wasn't, he didn't serve on the team that finalized and crafted some of the language and words around our mission statement. And so when, when Frank first heard of our uh, mission statement, he, he wasn't sure about it. He wasn't sure about that finalized wordsmith statement. And Frank didn't tell us at the time, but he confessed it later that he was a bit skeptical about it. His first thought was, well, where's Jesus in that statement? And we blamed it on Bernie there, wasn't in there, you know. <laughs> Sacrificial lamb. But before Frank stepped away from eldership at the end of the year for his sabbatical as an elder, uh, before he stepped away, we were all reflecting about all the work that had been done and some of the hard work and things that had been accomplished over the last few years. And he shared one of the most meaningful things an elder has ever said to me or the group of elders. And he confessed, he said, I was skeptical of the mission statement at first. But over time, it has become the single most influential tool I have ever had in my spiritual life. More than any scripture I've memorized, more than any other uh, spiritual event I've ever attended, it has done more for my faith than any other tool God has used in my life. And as a group that helped develop that statement, we were tremendously humbled by that statement because Frank is not someone who hands out compliments easy or confesses that he was wrong or changed his mind. But where Frank was convicted most was this idea at work, to be good news where we live, work, and play. And that he really questioned whether the people at work saw him as good news and that that would earn him the opportunity to share the good news at some point. But I was so proud to hear him say and to be working on, God is working on me that this mission statement is a tool to remind us of God's truth, that is our identity is in his grace, but our purpose is to serve and bless this world. It was true with Abraham, and it's true with us today, that our mission is to be the blessed people who then in turn bless Others, that our mission field is bigger than when we gather here on Sundays. It's when we scatter from here and live our lives Monday through Saturday. And that's where we are called to represent him and his kingdom. To be good news, where we live, work, and live. To be the people, the forgiven of God. To be the representatives of God where we live, work, and play. It is both our identity and our purpose. And 3C, this is who we've been called to be, and this is what we at 3C have been called to do, to be good news where we live, work, and play.
And so I want to conclude by asking you, which part of our mission statement do you need to wrap your heart and mind around today? The good news of your identity in Christ? Maybe you need reminded that you are or can be completely forgiven. That if you've given your life to Christ, you should not be spending your time worrying about whether you make the cut or whether you're worthy. You are not. But that is the gift of the good news, that he has covered you in his grace. Or maybe you got that. And it's time that you become an agent of good news where you live, work, and play. A, a mission that is outside of Sunday morning. That, that yes, the gathering is important, but the scattering to be good news where we live, work, and play is your purpose. Let's pray. God, God, um, Thank you for the reminder of our identity in you and what good news it is to us. And God, may we remember that we're no better or worse than anyone else, but we're all a bunch of sinners covered in your love and grace. And we're not worthy of it, but that's the beauty of it to you. That you've given it to us generously. And so because of your generosity, God, may we respond in kind, grateful, humble, dying to self, so that we can be good news where you have placed us, where you send us, where we live, work, and play. We thank you for that, Lord. We are honored to be your representatives. Help us to represent you well. In Jesus' name. at my feet It's okay if it's hard to believe I have faith you will do greater things It's my time to go But before I leave Go tell the world about Oh, uh-huh.
great week, everybody.